My name is Dr. Dobrik, Allison Dobrik. I am from the College of Education. I am helping to prepare our future elementary teachers, many of whom are in the room today. So this is you know, incredibly important and wonderful that you're here and that everyone else is here for hearing a lecture and hopefully very interactive and interesting discussion with Robert Berkowitz. He was born in Newark and raised in West Orange. He is a former lecturer in history at Rutgers University, and he has recently written and spoken about the Holocaust and its lessons for our times. His essays, The Long Damn Summer of 42, 9-11 and the Holocaust, and The Fate of the Tree of Life can be found on medium.com. He lives in Guilford, Connecticut. And with that, I'm going to pass. Thank you. Not the microphone, but the stage. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Dobrik, and uh, for inviting me here to speak. Uh, first time I've spoken in New Jersey to a mixed student faculty uh, group since I taught at Rutgers, I don't know, 150 years ago, it seems like. Uh, but um, I'm excited to be here. I feel like I'm back home. Uh, and, uh, so let me begin. Uh, this is both, in some ways, a history lesson and a teachable lesson, which I hope resonates with you because you are, for the most part, hopefully will be teaching on, in one way or another, either as teachers or as members of the community. Uh, let me begin by talking about pogrom. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with pogroms, but the word pogrom in Russian and Yiddish means devastation. It derives from a Russian word that means to destroy, to wreak havoc, to demolish violently. Historically, it's associated with violent outbursts against Jews that began in the 1880s and continued sporadically in waves for the next 30 to 50 years. Uh, the programs occurred mostly in Russia, the Ukraine, and Poland, where the overwhelming majority of world Jewry lived at the time. Uh, the programs are mostly named after cities, which I'm sure you've never heard of, for the most part. Uh, names like Kiev, Kishnev, Odessa, Bialystok, Lvov, Kielce. Uh, and those were the cities where the pogroms wrought the greatest amount of destruction and devastation to life and property. Uh, those pogroms are mostly unknown to, all, to all but students of history. How many of you have ever heard of any of those pogroms? Oh, great. Oh, so you're students of history. Good. <laughs> uh, one, po one pogrom stands apart. It occurred in Nazi Germany and Nazi occupied Austria in November of 1938, where a fraction, just 4% of world Jewry lived. It is called Kristallnacht. That's the German word. Uh, literally, it means crystal night. Some people, it's more familiar with the term the night of broken glass. Uh, so it is named that versus being named after a city like Berlin or Vienna, where the greatest amount of destruction during Kristallnacht occurred. And I'll explain there's a reason why uh, it's named. It's not named after a city. Uh, and it is remembered, although not nearly enough, although this group seems to be familiar with history. Uh, it's remembered because it alone of all pogroms is commemorated each year from November 9th, when it broke out, until November 12th, 81 years ago today, when it finally played itself out. So what makes Kristallnacht stand apart from all other pogroms? First, Kristallnacht was the most devastating of all pogroms. Uh, more than 1,000 synagogues, the center of Jewish and religious social life were partially or fully destroyed. Torched, bombed, sledgehammered, pillaged, they were turned into uninhabitable architectural corpses. 
roughly 7,500 businesses, the mainstay of Jewish economic life, were attacked and shuttered. Storefronts were reduced to rubble. Interiors were wrecked. Shelves were cleared of merchandise. Countless Jewish residences, schools, hospitals, homes for the aged, the poor, and the infirm, and orphaned were ransacked and made unlivable. And not even the sanctuaries of the dead were spared. Uh, Jewish cemeteries were desecrated, and the orphan and the tombstones were uprooted. The cruelty was unbridled. Mothers, fathers, children were dragged from their homes. They were battered, assaulted, bludgeoned, humiliated, and tormented. Families were evicted from residences, children from orphanages, patients from hospitals, and the elderly from old age homes. So try, try to think about what it would be like, something like this happening in your neighborhood, your town, your city, your village. Uh, you know, it, it's hard to fathom, uh, and uh, hopefully it will never happen here or anywhere else, but uh, uh, it, it was unimaginable. Kristallnacht basically destroyed any pretense of sustainable life for the remaining 750,000 Jews in Germany and Austria, which was its intent. Uh, and which is what really sets Kristallnacht apart from all other programs. It was intended not just to intimidate, terrorize, but to literally destroy all Jewish life in Germany and Austria. There's a book with the title, Brighter Than a Thousand Suns. Uh, I read it as a 17-year-old. It was required read, summer reading for freshman orientation at Rutgers University. Uh, I read it. Another book was Eichmann in Jerusalem by Hannah Arendt. Uh, the book is about the making of the atomic bomb during World War II. And the title is loosely borrowed from a line in the Hindu epic, Bhagavad Gita, that purportedly flashed through the mind of Robert Oppenheimer, who was the father of the atomic bomb, when he, it first exploded in New Mexico. The stanza in which that line appears ends with the words, quote, I am become death, the shatterer of worlds. Oppenheimer was said to have uttered those words at the time, presumably after the debris-filled mushroom cloud spread like a shroud over the vast New Mexican desert sky. And since he was reflecting on the the total devastation and destruction of the bomb and the relief radiation <coughs> left in its wake. One can only imagine what it was like for Jews to witness the hundreds of roaring flames rising up from the burning wood frame synagogues and the multitude of bonfires of altar cloths, arcs, Torah scrolls, sanctuary benches, and religious artifacts illuminating the Berlin and Vienna skies. One rabbi whose synagogue was ablaze in flames was surprised how, how bright the Berlin sky appeared at 2 in the morning. When I look at photographic images of dark plumes of smoke billowing up from the synagogues, I am reminded of those haunting words from the Bhagavad Gita. If Kristallnacht was not a holocaust, given the destruction and death it wrought, I am, it was certainly, quote, a shatterer of worlds for German and Austrian Jewry. And by that measure, it was darker than a thousand pogroms. Second, besides its devastation, Kristallnacht was by far the most fully orchestrated of all programs. It wasn't just a kind of spontaneous outburst of local citizens. 
Despite elements of spontaneity and improvisation, it was guided and incited by the Nazi state apparatus from the moment word got out that the 17-year-old Herschel Greenspan critically injured a Nazi diplomat at the German embassy in Paris on November 7th. Although there was no evidence then or since that Greenspan had acted on his own, the Nazi propaganda machine blamed an international Jewish conspiracy. The Nazis then exploited that lie to whip up a combustible brew of hate, rage, and vengeance against every Jew living in its midst. When two days later, on November 9th, the German diplomat was pronounced dead, Joseph Goebbels, the Nazi minister of propaganda, urged Hitler to, quote, unleash the wrath of the people. Hitler blithely agreed to, quote, let them have their fling. In the modern day parlance is throw them red meat. The them were the Nazi stormtroopers and the rabid Nazi party members. And so instructions went out and the fling began that launched one of the greatest terrorist attacks in modern times. One that was purposefully designed to drive an entire innocent and peace, peaceable ethno-religious population beyond its, ex, its newly expanded borders. Again, modern day parlance is ethnic cleansing. Third, besides it being orchestrated, it was also the most popularly embraced pogrom of, of all times. Partic participation extended well beyond the Gestapo, which was the Nazi police, and the members of the Nazi party. Ordinary citizens from all walks of life, including teachers, school children, shopkeepers, professionals, members of youth organizations, business people, neighbors, and housewives joined in the smashing, the ransacking, the looting, the terrorizing, and the humiliating. Many more cheered them on. A Berlin reporter for the London Daily Telegraph described, quote, fashionably dressed women clapping their hands with glee with respectable middle-class mothers holding up their babies to see the fun. Even more neighbors passively went along, including those who took exception especially to the excesses of the destruction of physical property that besmirched their community and inconvenienced their daily routines. So they seem to be more concerned about the destruction of property than the impact it had on human life. Uh, to borrow and extend the phrase, it takes a village, which we think of in, in positive terms, to do good things, Kristallnacht took a chunk of the nation to carry out. So it was not just a small group, although that was the, that was the trigger, the leadership and the, and, and the immediate hardcore members, but it took a larger chunk of the population to make it happen. Uh, fourth, Kristallnacht was the most unsettling of all pogroms. And what makes it so unnervingly so set unsettling, and still does, is that it was carried out by highly civilized and cultured nation, one that had given the world Bach, Beethoven, Brahms, Goethe, Heine, and Einstein. Uh, Reinhard Heydrich, who was head of the SS, ordered the Kristallnacht mass roundups and deportations, was the son of a composer and an opera singer. His father was the founder of a renowned conservatory of music. The, the depth of descent from a society that was so civilized and cultured into one so barbarous and depraved had really no parallel in pi any prior program. 
uh, perhaps in all of history up until that point in time, if not after. Fifth, Kristallnacht was by far the most consequential of all programs. Uh, one Jewish witness recounted, you quoted the word, everything has changed. Physical violence in the service of vicious and savage hate against a minority group solely because of its religion was sanctioned, justified, and normalized. Whatever moral compass might have guided the general population was fully shattered. Those who felt shame and shed a few tears for their Jewish neighbors were numb. Whatever urge to condemn and will to resist that remained among the few withering ranks of audacious souls was once and for all extinguished. <clears throat> and basically, the ethical and moral background, backbone of the German nation was broken for good, which allowed the, gave the Nazi leadership a free hand now to finally rid Jews by whatever means it chose. And so it did. On November 12th, the day Kristallnacht came to an end, Hiller ordered that, quote, the Jewish question be, quote, summed up and coordinated once and for all, and, quote, solved one way or another. Two months later, Heydrich was tasked with, quote, promoting em emigration of the Jews from Germany by all means. And then five days after that, <coughs> Hitler went before the Reichstag, which was the German parliament, on the sixth anniversary of his becoming chancellor, and reminded the members <coughs> that during his struggle for power back in the 1920s, when he, did, when he had promised to, quote, settle the Jewish problem. He then offered up another prophecy, predicting that <coughs> if war comes, a war we now know he was already planning, it would result in, quote, the annihilation of the Jewish race in Europe. Although plans for the final solution, which was the extermination of five and a half to six million Jews, uh, was still three years into the future, it was now a giant step closer to becoming thinkable imaginable, and plausible. Sixth, Kristallnacht was the most tragic of all programs. And, and what makes it tragic beyond its catastrophic ramifications that it paved the way for the Holocaust is that it didn't have to happen. Had the democracies of the world including England, France, and the United States, stood up to Hitler after the occupation of Austria and the eight weeks vicious program that followed it, which they did not. Had they heeded the cry of multiple multitudes of Jewish refugees desperately clamoring for asylum when they convened the one and only international refugee crisis refugee conference that summer, uh, which they did not by refusing to raise their collectively meager immigration quotas. Had they stood up to Hitler at the Munich conference in the fall, which they did not by ceding large slice of Czechoslovakian Republic to Hitler. Had they stood up in all those instances and done so with a sense of urgency and forcefulness, Hitler would have been far less emboldened to, quote, let them have their fling. And Herschel Greenspan would have been far less disposed to entertain the thought of committing that misguided act of protest that gave Hitler his pretext for Kristallnacht. And I probably wouldn't be standing here today giving a talk on Kristallnacht. Uh, Herschel's own story highlights the real tragedy of Kristallnacht. When 17-year-old Herschel walked into the German embassy on November 7th, among the items in his possession 
were two handwritten postcards. The first was from his sister, Esther, received on November 3rd. From it, Herschel learned that his mother, father, and two siblings had been visited by the Gestapo, had been issued expulsion papers, ordered out of the country, and taken to police headquarters. Esther concluded her brief note with the ominous words, quote, everything was finished for us. Though she spared her younger brother the horrific details of what had transpired, it took little imagination for her Herschel to fill them in. He happened to be a voracious reader of the news for a 17-year-old. And the trials and tribulations of Herschel's family and an estimated 17,000 Polish-born citizens living in Germany blanketed the front page of every major newspaper in Paris, London, and New York in, a, in, a, in, a, in what has come to be known as the Pol, Poland Action. The New York Times described it as possibly the greatest mass deportation of recent times. In dragnet-style raids, thousands of men, women, children, the elderly, and the infirm were seized at home, at workplace, hauled into police stations, and forced to sign deportation pa papers. Wives and children wept as husbands were hus herded into vans and special, quote, slow-moving trains, like, according, like sheep corralled for slaughter is the way the Times described the scene. Exhausted, hungry, near penniless, and with little more than a suitcase of personal belonging, when they arrived at the borders, deportees were assembled by SS frontier guards who were armed with fixed bayonets, machine guns, and whips. The border crossing was was more harrowing. Many waded in ankle deep waters. Women were made to run across open fields and for over an hour. Bones were broken. Elderly people collapsed under the weight of their suitcases. Those who faltered were whiplashed, jabbed with bayonets, or tramp trampled, including Herschel's father, Zindel. Some died of exhaustion, exposure, and stress. Others took their own lives. Hundreds suffered injuries that required hospitalization. In many ways, this was basically a trial run for the roundups into the cattle cars to the death camps three and a half years later. The second postcard in Herschel's possession when he entered the German embassy was from himself. It was hand, a handwritten plea to his parents for forgiveness and to the democracies of the world to wake up to the tragedy befalling his people. Herschel's note read, with God's help, my dear parents, I couldn't do otherwise. God must forgive me. My heart bleeds when I think of our tragedy and that of 12,000 Jews. I have to protest in a way that the whole world hears my protest. And I intend to do. I beg your forgiveness. This was basically before he ended up firing five shots at the Nazi diplomat. Sadly, Herschel's protest was heard the loudest by Hitler. What, what makes Kristallnacht so much more tragic is that even after it happened, the democracies of the world failed to learn from it. They failed to meaningfully and unequivocally stand up to Hitler and address what Herschel called, quote, our tragedy. Unlike the final solution, which was hidden from public view until it was well underway, Kristallnacht was brazenly carried out in the open. It was more widely covered than any event befalling the Jews during the entire Nazi era. There was no excuse not to act, no if only we knew defense. Admittedly, there were outcries of condemnation. And to be fair, the US did recall its ambassador from Germany in protest. However, not one democracy broke off diplomatic relations with Germany 
not even when Hitler plowed into the remainder of Czechoslovakia four months later and proclaimed the protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia. And despite expressions of deep and widespread sympathy for its victims, immigration restrictions remained as tight as ever for the vast majority of the swelling number of refugees desperately seeking to escape Germany and Austria and increasingly Poland, which had become a hotbed of anti-Semitism with its own recent history of pogroms, uh, university ghetto benches, and the publicly stated wish of the, its government to be rid of its three and a half million, quote, surplus Jews. On November 15th, three days after Kristallnacht, Franklin Delano Roosevelt opened a press conference by stating, quote, the news of the last few days from Germany has de deeply shocked public opinion in the United States. End of quote. Sadly, the shock was not great enough to shake the American public out of its callous indifference. In a Gallup public opinion poll conducted the following January, those surveyed were asked, quote, it has been proposed to bring this, to this country 10,000 refugee children from Germany, most of them Jewish, to be taken care of in American homes. Should the government permit these children to come in, was the question. 61% of those surveyed said no. In a fortune poll conducted in April, 83% of those surveyed opposed any increase in immigration quotas. The US Congress read the political winds, whipped up by such American firsters as Hitler admirer Charles Lindbergh, who received and gratefully accepted the Nazi service cross of the German eagle three weeks before Kristallnacht, and radio, ho radio talk show host father Charles Coughlin, who ranted to his 30 million listeners about, quote, sending Jews back where they came from in leaky boats. Sound familiar? In June, a bill that would have temporarily given those children asylum never made it out of a congressional committee. The same month, in June, more than 900 Jewish refugees fleeing Nazi Germany were anchored off the coastal waters of Florida. They could actually see the beaches. Despite having exit visas from Germany, and in most cases, affidavits of support from US citizens, immigration authorities denied them asylum on the grounds that quotas had been fulfilled for the year. Though the ship that returned to Germany was not leaky, as Father Coughlin would have wished, more than 250 of those passengers would perish in the Holocaust. In England, despite giving temporary asylum to 10,000 children, a number of whom were made parentless by Kristallnacht, the government of Neville Chamberlain, the architect of the Munich Agreement, issued a British white paper that all but slammed shut the door to immigration to the Yeshiv in Palestine. So, Emboldened by the meek and equivocating response of the democracies of the world to Kristallnacht and its victims, and to the Nazi lust for land, Hitler invaded Poland with its three and a half million Jews. With no outlet for escape, almost all three and a half million, <coughs> including those who survived the Poland action deportation would meet their final destination in the killing centers of Auschwitz, Belzec, and Treblinka. And in the case of Herschel's sister, Esther, who we fondly called Berta, her final destination would be in an open pit in eastern Poland. That was then. Today, there is a synagogue in Pittsburgh named the Tree of Life. Its ark 
houses a Torah scroll rescued from a synagogue in forced Lausitz, Germany. That German synagogue was one of the thousand raided, burned, and demolished during Kristallnacht. Many of the forced Lausitz congregants were themselves emigres from Poland. <coughs> Some of them were rounded up in the Poland action, and most would later perish in the Holocaust. On the 80th anniversary of Poland action, to the day, a self-proclaimed neo-Nazi entered the Tree of Life synagogue and indiscriminately gunned down 11 Sabbath worshipers. It was the deadliest attack on the American Jewish community in history. Shortly before he entered the synagogue, he made two posts. The first read, quote, why hello there, Hias, H-I-A-S. You like bringing hostile murder murderers to dwell among us. The second post, within hours of the mass murder, read, quote, <coughs> quote, Hias likes to bring invaders in that kill our people. I can't sit and watch my people get slaughtered. Screw the optics, I'm coming in. Both posts refer to HIAS, the acronym for the Hebrew Immigration Aid Society. Founded in 1881, initially to help Jews fleeing pogroms in Russia, it played an oversized role in the rescue and resettlement of Jewish refugees who were victims of Nazi persecution. More recently, HIAS has come, become the international arm of the American Jewish community that helps rescue and resettle refugees and other displaced people of all background, backgrounds who are victims of persecution and violence. One of its many initiatives in what has become the greatest worldwide refugee crisis since the 1930s is assisting refugees at our southern border and helping them start a new life in America. The, quote, murderers and invaders whom the assailant referred to were the violence fleeing Hondurans, Guatemalans, and El Salvadorian immigrants. Those refugees made up the caravan that our, quote, American first president claimed was infested with criminals and Middle Eastern terrorists. Egre egregiously false claims cynically made to alarm voters in order to win the midterm elections in 2018 and to justify the separation of asylum-seeking children <laughs> from their parents and their placement in unfit for human detention centers. Less than a year later, just a few months ago, on Yom Kippur, which is the holiest of the holy days in the Jewish calendar, a far-right, anti-Semite, and anti-Muslim neo-Nazi attempted to break into a synagogue in Halle, Germany, and repeat the massacre that occurred at the Tree of Life synagogue nearly a year before. He failed. But after retreating from the synagogue, he killed two innocent bystanders in a fit of frustration and rage. During Kristallnacht, that synagogue's pre precursor had been largely destroyed, nearby homes burned down, stores and homes looted, and adult men rounded up and deported to Buchenwald, the concentration camp. Along Halle's sidewalks are, quote, witness stones that front many of the homes of Jews who perished in the Holocaust. The city of Halle is also the birthplace of Reinhardt Heydrich, head of the SS. Heydrich not only oversaw the Poland Aksion and ordered the mass roundups and deportations during Kristallnacht, he also directed the killing units that executed what is called the Holocaust by bullets that took more than two million lives. And if that was not enough, he orchestrated the final solution. 
The secret plan to exterminate European Jewry was deservedly codenamed Operation Reinhardt. Many of the 1,300 Jews of Halle who survived Kristallnacht perished in the Holocaust. More than a few were Heydrich's childhood neighbors. Halle is also located near the state of Thuringia, where the far-right far Alternative for German Party won 23% of the vote in a recent statewide election. 23% of the vote. In 2017, its co-leader, Bjorn Hock, who co-heads the party in Thuringia, said Germans were, quote, the only people in the world to plant a monument of shame in the heart of their capital, end of quote. He was referring to the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin. The other co-head, Alexander Garland, has downplayed the Nazi era as, quote, a speck of bird poop. The Hebrew word, Amada is a prayer that is recited when standing. The word literally means stand. I translate it to mean stand up, which my father often had to remind me to do when reciting it. The word has come to be associated with all acts of compassion and resistance before and during the Holocaust. There are many examples of it. To name just a few, there was Rabbi Joachim Prince. He's from New Jersey, probably one of the greatest rabbis, not only to come out of New Jersey, but one of the great spirit, greatest spiritual leaders of the 20th century, who at great risk to his life pro protested from his pulpit in Berlin about the metastasizing anti-Semitism in the years leading up to Kristallnacht. There were the Polish Jewish community and aid societies that provided the victims of the Poland action with food, clothing, blankets, and medical care, and who worked tirelessly to shame the Polish government into finally allowing them to stay. There were the English Jewish and Quaker rescue and relief organizations that successfully lobbied for the asylum of 10,000 refugee children in the aftermath of Kristallnacht and assume their, their care under the Kinder Transport Rescue Program. There was Bishop Sheptesky, head of the Ukrainian Catholic Church, who issued pastoral letters forbidding members of the church from aiding and abetting in the murder of Jews and who personally provided safe haven for hundreds of Jews. There was the Catholic family who at great risk to their life hid my two cousins, the only surviving members of my countless Polish relatives. And of course there was Hyas. If there is one less lesson to be learned from the tragedy of Kristallnacht, it is the need to stand up Stand up to self-serving demagogues of any nation, including our own, who cynically stoke the embers of fear, resentment, and hate by demonizing and scapegoating religious, ethnic, and racial minorities. Stand up for democracy before it is too late. It is more fragile than ever and can die in the blink of an eye as it did in Weimar, Germany. Stand up to those who spew hate in all its myriad forms by calling them out. And stand up for the victims of discrimination and hate of whatever race, ethnicity, and religion. Let me close with this. On the evening of November 9th, 1938, when official word went out to begin the reign of terror that would come to be known as Kristallnacht, the Nazi leadership was gathered 
in Munich to celebrate the 15th anniversary of the Beer Hall Putsch. That 1923 attempt to overthrow the Weimar Republic was an abysmal failure. Hitler was thrown in jail. At the time, many viewed Hitler as a clown, and his army of 600 fanatical and hate-filled brown shirts as a band of motley and pathetic fools akin to Keystone Cops. Neither the Beer Hall Putsch nor the virulent anti-Semitic manifesto Mein Kampf that Hitler wrote during his nine months in prison were taken seriously. Both should have been wake-up calls to the German nation. Charlotte, Charlottesville, Pittsburgh, New Zealand, Hoe, El Paso, Halle, and Thuringia are our wake-up calls. <coughs> are we listening? Thank you. Thank you very much. We have some time for questions. So the floor is open. I'll come to you. Questions? Do Comments? Some reflections in today's politics, particularly with uh, today's uh, Supreme Court uh, upcoming decision on DACA. Uh, uh, students and young people who have uh, been born here but whose parents were not. Uh, born in America and have a uh, threatening of their status in the United States as students and workers and, um, and as young people to stay in America. You see a direct uh, or indirect uh, ripple effect from this sort of fascist thinking. Yeah, it, it's, it's, you know, DACA could have been solved so easily uh, you know, several years ago and, and they're on the edge of, of solving it bipartisan efforts to solve it through the immigration reform program uh, was a nice balance, understanding, recognizing that you cannot let everyone into the country, uh, but understanding that under certain circumstances you need to kind of make adjustments uh, and make it work and, and integrate into the society people who are immigrants, like all of us are immigrants. Uh, and uh, what's happened, is it's, it's become, again, it's, it's been used and exploited. Uh, the opposition to DACA, the, the, uh, the whole immigration policy, the border walls, have been, they've been used to whip up fear, anger, anxiety, and venom uh, that has nothing to do with the realities on the ground, but that are simply designed to, again, throw red meat to the base and to really... Uh, hyperactive up the fears and anxieties and, and it uh, rather than simply having a an honest fair debate about policy and and what's workable what's not work make what makes sense uh, make accommodations to the extent possible to those who are suffering from violence that is, is massive in, in the Central American countries uh, we can do that and the, the problem is that that ability to have a, a a, a, con a civil conversation has been, uh, you know, basically uh, removed from from the current realities. Yes. The events of Kristallnacht and the Holocaust preceded. Uh, the events of Kristallnacht and the Holocaust preceded the internet and social media. Um, how uh, will the social media change the way people can respond? Um, are there ways that it can empower us? Or, or is it just spreading falsehoods and panic and negative types of uh, issues? Uh, you know, medias, all forms of media throughout history have been used for good and bad purposes. Uh, it just, it's just become more leveraged today it's, media has become more democratic in both positive and negative ways, and it allows people access to have community interactions that are both positive and both negative. Uh, I think the real challenge is, my experience is that the more 
people of different backgrounds, whether it's religious, ethnic, or racial, come together, meet each other face to face, uh, uh, become familiar with them, who they are, that it, it, it takes away a lot of that xenophobia, that anxiety about the other. And, and I think that's, and I don't, I'm not sure exactly to what extent media can accomplish that, uh, but any kind of platform, whether it's virtual or, or personal, one-on-one, uh, two-on-one, -on -one, three-on-one, people come together and they, uh, you know, they have, they have a different impression. I, I had one experience when a couple of years ago, uh, I was uh, at a benefit program for an organization in Connecticut called IRIS, which was a, kind of like a rescue and refugee uh, nonprofit organization. And uh, the, uh, this group of, uh, I believe it was Syrian refugees, family, who were living in New Haven, Connecticut, came to, the, came to this benefit. And we talked to, to the mother and the two children. And, uh, and they, were, they were doing well. They were struggling, but they were doing well. They were getting educated. Uh, child was going to school, they were making friends in the community, et cetera. And, and I, I looked at them and I just, I thought of all my relatives who died in the Holocaust. And had there been organizations like, like this IRIS group or HIAS back then to, to, to provide the support to bring people in, that they would still be alive today or at least their, their descendants would still be alive today. Uh, so to me, it's, it's interacting. And I felt, I felt different. I, I connected with the Syrian refugees uh, as human beings, as not the other, as people who reminded me of my relatives. No different, you know, different color of skin, different accents, uh, no different, human beings. Same issues, children going to school, you know, you know, learning, you know, what it's like being a teenager and all the ups and downs. They're human beings, and that's that's the challenge. And and in some ways, the media, you know, tends to become so hyperbolic that you know it forgets that we're all human beings. We're all just human beings trying to get through life, trying to struggle, make you know, just make our lives work for us, and all that. And uh, so, yeah. Dr. Berkowitz, I'm Eric Weiss, and I, I uh, represent the Shoah Committee of the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs. Um, you argue that the West did not respond, and the classic response is that the West was concerned about the spread of communism. That, that fear drove support of the opposition to communism, which was Nazi fa fascism. But there have been other genocides, Darfur, Cambodia. Um, you can argue that Syria is also a genocide yeah. in a way. And, and, and at, this, at this moment, there's another ethnic cleansing going on. Yeah. It's the, the Kurds. Yeah. Um, so you, you ask us to stand up. What practical, in what practical way can we stand up to defend the Kurdish people? Us, as Americans? Mm -hmm. Vote <laughs> at this point. I mean, it, it, it really comes down to uh, having leadership in this country that, and uh, elected officials in this country who understand, or at least compassionate and, and empathetic enough to be willing to grapple with these issues and, and understand that they really can only be addressed through international cooperation. It can't be one nation, it can't be the U.S. alone. It's got to be, again, the democracies of the world. And then even the non-democracies that, that you know, still have a sense of compassion and, uh, for, for those millions who are refugees and who are suffering potential uh, ethnic cleansing. Uh, it can only happen in a collaborative effort where parties sit down and try to figure out how best to deal with what's a very complicated uh, situation worldwide. I mean, it's, it's, we've got 30 to 40 million refugees worldwide. And many of them 
you need to find a home for them. And in most cases, we need to find a home where they come from to the extent possible. In Central America, you, know, you have the issue of a constant cycle of violence, <coughs> gangs that, that totally control the streets, uh, military force that basically is heavily up to their eyeballs in the drug trade, uh, and in, in collab basically collaborate with the gangs who they've provided guns with. Uh, so it's complex, and, and so as individual citizens, I think we have to start with our, you know, our elected officials and do what we can to bring into leadership positions people who at least are willing to address and say, yeah, let's, let's figure out how to deal with what is a complicated set of events worldwide. I mean, there's not one continent today where you don't have ethnic cleansing. Uh, you know, it's, it's, you have to begin somewhere. And uh, as, as I was telling uh, Dr. Dobrik earlier, uh, before, you know, every day I wake up in the morning and, de and depending on which side of the bed I, I wake up on or which, what was the last breaking news story I heard, I'm either deeply cynical or deeply hopeful. And, you know, I, I surrender to the cynicism and so I let it accept it and, and say it's overwhelming and then I accept it and then I move on and, and move from cynicism back to hope. And, uh, and that's, that's all we can do. Thank you for your question. Um, you mentioned uh, taking away this idea that we have to stand up, but I was wondering as an educator, um, what other are, you know, significant takeaways do you, do you have from Kristallnacht and the Tree of Life shooting um, for us? What are, the, what are the things that we can understand from it that are most powerful? Because to me, these things still prove to bewilder. Even when you point out all the roots, even when you point out all the history, I still don't understand it. You have to understand the what to make of, of such horrific experiences coming from, you know, the banality of evil. Yeah, banal yeah it's, it's the banal I, I think there's always going to be banality of evil. And, and what, I tried to, what I tried to point out in, 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 the, in the kind of the years, in the crystal knock was that, that it really took a chunk of the nation to make it happen. And that there, there was, there was a, probably 60% of the people in Germany whether it was in the 20s or the 1930s when Hitler came to power, that couldn't stand Hitler. They couldn't stand the Nazis. They, 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 you know, they found them you know, evil. They found them horrific, just like you know, the neo-Nazis today. But there were two things that went on. There was a lot of infighting. And there was also, oh, it's going to go away. It was a little bit, I've got to deal with my own realities. I can't deal with what's going on out there. And it's going to take kind of the silent majority to stand up because there's always going to be evil. That's never going to go away. I mean, there's always going to be people for whatever reasons, whether, whether it's, it's their, just the way they were wired, how they were raised, you know, with some defective gene that, that keeps, you know, re replicating itself. And you tend to find that it's the evil people or the mean-spirited people tend to be the most vocal and the most powerful. It's like the bully in elementary school or junior high school or high school. You know, it's the bully that tends to get the most attention and that tends to seem more, over, more powerful than they are. It's, and it's only so because nobody stands up to the bully or nobody stands up to the evil. Once, somebody, once a group of people gather together and stand up <laughs> to the bully or to evil, then in some ways they, you know, they go away. And that was my point about with, with Hitler. Hitler was emboldened that the, in a sense there was a silence uh, of action, not, of, de not of, of words, but a silence of deeds on the part of the democracies of the world. And, uh, and it was, we have other things to do. Uh, <coughs> this gentleman mentioned, you know, reasons why we didn't let refugees come to the country. Another reason was, at the time, it was because we were in the Depression. So any refugees were going to, quote, compete for jobs in this country. Today, you know, we have a relatively booming economy. I mean, 
it's not perfect. There's a lot of uh, lack of equality in terms of wealth and income. But relatively speaking, we're not living through a depression right now. And look, so we find another excuse. You know, we can't let people come into our borders because whatever they're going to, you know, are they going to take jobs away? Are they going to, you know, are they, you know, are, are they going to be gang members? So you always find reasons not to do things. Uh, but I, I think it's, it's, it's standing up and, and staying up in different ways. It's not, you know, it's not just speaking out. It, it's, it's, it's speaking to neighbors, uh, having conversations, even with people with whom you disagree. And I have friends who say, why do you talk to that person? That person is, is, is you're never going to change that person. And I say, you know, at the edges. They may not change in front of me, but they may go home at night and hmm, think about it. I, I just, uh, a version of this, art, of this presentation I just published, and a neighbor of mine who is both Jewish and a supporter of Trump read the article and she called me and she said, you know what, maybe you're right, maybe you're right. There's one person. And maybe she was being kind to me because you know, I, was, I was her neighbor. But, uh, but, but she, she didn't have to say that. So it's, it's the little victories sometimes that, that make a difference. Yeah. And teachers, I mean, that's the thing. Part of education, that's, for those of you who are going to become teachers, uh, you know, my greatest teachers, I mean, I am who I am because of my teachers, uh, whether they were teacher, classroom teachers or Rabbi Prince, who was probably my greatest mentor in my growing up years uh, you know, in terms of getting involved in the civil rights movement and uh, other, other causes. Uh, you know, it, it's those, those mentors. So you have no idea how valuable it is to be a teacher and how teachers are valued. Uh, you don't realize it at the time. Students tend to not appreciate you. You've got to have, but you need perspective. You need perspective. Uh, you know, I go to high school reunions or college, especially high school reunions, I go back and, and so-and-so, who, who was a nightmare to so many of our teachers, would, would, would reminisce about, oh, God, I, can't, I don't know what I would have done if, if I didn't have so-and-so as my teacher. I mean, he just made a difference in my life. And I said, why don't you tell him that then, or and act like, <laughs> like he did then? <laughs> so uh, so you, being a teacher is, is one of, to me, the one of the great uh, vocations uh, that you could ever enter in, for those of you who are. And even if you're not a teacher, you're not professionally a teacher, you, you're, you can be a teacher in so many other ways. Any other questions, thoughts? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.